Welcome to the Exam Room Live, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us here on Facebook and on YouTube. Today, my friend, is your show filled with your questions as we attempt to bust some vegan myths and crush some diet confusion and clear up the health picture altogether. And so turning clutter into clarity for us today and prescribing answers are Dr. Neil Barnard, Hey there, Jack. Good to see you, sir. As well as Dr. Jim Loomis. Thanks for flexing your brain muscle with us today. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. Happy to be here. <laughs> All right. If you have a question for either Dr. Loomis or Dr. Barnard, go ahead and drop that in the comments section. Now let's fill up that doctor's mailbag. Going to be answering a ton of these questions today. You can also send them to us on Twitter using the hashtag exam room live. But before we go any further, why not? Let's get caught up on the latest headlines. Here are the health happenings for Friday, October 16th. 2020. It is another milestone day in the pandemic. Eight million Americans now having been infected by the coronavirus. 44 states in Washington, D.C. seeing a surge of infections. Nearly 64,000 new cases added to the total Thursday, a number not seen since late July. And while caseloads continue climbing and many hospitals swelling to capacity, there has not been a spike in the number of deaths yet giving hope that while there is no cure, doctors are better able to treat the virus as the nation grieves the loss of 218,000 of its residents. In other news, scientists are studying the role that coffee may play in protecting you from Parkinson's disease. A study of nearly 370 adults finds those who have the disease and a mutated form of a specific gene tied to it had caffeine levels that were 76% lower than other participants. The study also finds those with the mutated gene, known as LRRK2, may have an unexplained aversion to caffeine, consuming 41% less than others. The study's authors, though, caution more research is needed. And finally, meat lovers have said for generations that everything is better with bacon. And now, even if you're a bacaholic who goes vegan, you can still say the same thing. Check this out. Plant-based sales of plant-based bacon, I should say, they are skyrocketing. And UK-based company This is cashing in. The company says it has sold four and a half million portions of vegan bacon called you guessed it, this isn't bacon. The meatless alternative is described as a hyper-realistic plant-based food for meat lovers. And it's definitely not bacon. How about that? All right, Q&A time here on the Exam Room Live. So go ahead and drop your questions in the comments section now. Send them to us on Twitter, at Chuck Carroll WLC, or at PCRM. Just make sure that you use that hashtag, Exam Room Live. So let's go ahead and dive right into that doctor's mailbag as we welcome Drs. Neil Barnard and Dr. Jim Loomis back to the show. Gentlemen, are you ready for a little bit of everything? You never know what's coming your way. You bet, Chuck. Yeah. All right. Dr. Barnard, let's start with you. This is a question that comes up quite frequently, but one nonetheless that it's important that we keep tackling. This is a question that comes to us from Emma, sent this to me on Instagram. She writes, my husband was recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. His numbers are in the 200s, and I'm not quite sure what that means, but I want to know if he can eat fresh fruits, and if so, are there any that are safer than others? Okay. Well, first of all, your husband, uh, he, he's got a health challenge, but it's one where he can make tremendous pro progress and he's lucky to have you looking out for him. The, uh, regarding fruit, the answer is yes, he can eat fruit and really should. Um, we've talked about this a number of times. The cause of, well, type 2 diabetes begins when the cells are unable to pull sugar out of the blood. And so the sugar builds up in the blood. And so your doctor will say, you've got a high blood sugar. And normally that sugar should go into the muscle cells, into the liver cells and out of the blood. And why is it not getting into the cells? Because the cells are filled with fat. And so the fat that comes from 
cheese and meat and chicken and fish and fryer grease and all that stuff um, that builds up in the cells. And the technical term for it is intramyocellular lipid in the muscles and hepatocellular lipid in the liver cells. Um, that That's the problem. So do we want to change the diet to get rid of that fat? So what do I do? I avoid eating animal products and I keep vegetable oils really low and that fat starts to dissipate and then the sugar can get out of the blood into the cells. So where do fruit fit in? They don't have any animal fat at all. They don't have much of any kind of fat. So the more the better. Um, your your uh, husband will worry. He'll say, well, fruit has sugar and that will, will drive my sugar higher. And after you eat a piece of fruit, your, your blood sugar will marginally go up. But over the long run, if you're following a plant-based diet with plenty of fruit, that insulin resistance goes down, your blood sugars will fall. All right, Dr. Loomis, coming to you for this one. This is a question about fresh versus frozen. Edith wants to know, does freezing fruit affect its fiber content or other nutrients? No, that's a great question, especially as we're getting into winter time. And uh, so the availability of fresh fruits might not be, they might not be so readily available. Um, frozen fruits and vegetables are a great alternative. Um, the, there's really minimum loss in nutrients, no change in fiber. Um, so I think that, that um, um, shifting to, to using frozen uh, fruits and vegetables during the winter time is a great alternative, a great way to continue to get your, your fruits and vegetables that you need every day. All right, let's go ahead and stick with you. This is another question uh, about diabetes here. Uh, someone wants to know, can people with type 2 diabetes have tea or coffee? Any effect there that you know of? Uh, no, and there's, you know, the, the both tea and coffee have a lot of very powerful antioxidants and have, and so there may actually be some health benefits. Now you can drink too much, you know, caffeine and you probably want to limit it to, you know, two or three cups of coffee a day at most. Now, um, there is some evidence that 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 uh, unfiltered coffee, like in a French press, uh, may actually raise LDL levels in some patients. And obviously, if you're a type two diabetic, it's it's even more important to keep an eye on your cholesterol. Um, and also, you want to be sure you're not putting milk and sugar in the coffee. Uh, but nothing wrong with black coffee, tea, green tea uh, in moderation. In fact, there may be some health benefits. Probably don't want to do unfiltered coffee, especially if you're having trouble with your cholesterol. All right. Good to know. Dr. Barnard, coming to you for this one. It's a question about iron. Someone writes that I have low iron levels, but I eat a massive amount of greens and even eat vitamin C to help with absorption. What can I do? Okay. A um, couple things. Um, you obviously do need iron. Iron is part of hemoglobin that carries oxygen from place to place. So and so if you are really low in iron, you can eventually become anemic. However, iron is a double-edged sword. If you have too much iron, we learned a long time ago that that increases the risk for heart disease, and it probably increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease too. So where we are now with this is that it's actually good to be in, certainly in the normal range on your various iron tests, but to be sort of at the low end of normal. So if you're at the low end of normal and you're not symptomatic and your doctor isn't saying that you're anemic, that's actually okay. And you don't want to aspire to do to have a higher iron level than that. And what you're doing is right. Um, you're having lots of green leafy vegetables. They are loaded with iron. And uh, if you have vitamin C rich uh, foods along with them, that increases the iron absorption. Um, if you are exercising a lot, that can end up causing some iron losses uh, as well. And so if that's you, you might need extra iron. And in, in a rare case, a person even needs to supplement, but I wouldn't start there. All right, Dr. Barnard, sticking with you here. Rula wants to know about coconut oil. You know, so many people claim that coconut oil is a healthy oil, but she wants to know, it is very popular, but it is also known to have a high amount of saturated fat. So what is your recommendation when it comes to coconut oil? It's hype. Um, it's somebody's got acres and acres of coconut trees palm trees, and they are selling the coconuts and they have been hyping uh, the supposed benefits of coconut oil. It, it, you're, what you said is exactly right. It's, it does have a lot of saturated fat in it that will raise your cholesterol levels. Um, so I would use it in your hair, use it on your skin, um, shine your shoes with it. I wouldn't eat it. All right, Dr. Loomis, coming to you. This is uh, right up your alley, having been in the Game Changers documentary. It's a question from Patty. She writes, my son is trying to go vegetarian, but feels that he needs to eat testosterone foods to build muscles. How do you do that? And is it even a thing? 
Yeah, so that's a, a, a great question. So first of all, there's really no such, there's no such thing as a testosterone food. Uh, testosterone is a hormone uh, made um, um, in, in men in, uh, in the testes. And it's an anabolic steroid that it helps us build muscle, maintain muscle mass, um, such as that. And we, we, you do need it to, to grow muscles. Taking, you know, artificially supplementing with testosterone can create a, a whole host of medical issues that are not good. Um, and so there's a lot of health, you know, the people who, athletes who, bodybuilders and such who inject exogenous hormones, uh, testosterone, it, it cre creates a lot of health problems. Um, Interestingly enough, and this was pointed out in the movie, um, in the Game Changers movie, uh, uh, athletes on a plant-based diet actually have higher levels of testosterone than, than, than uh, people who uh, follow more of an omnivorous diet. Um, you know, so, so really, there, there's really no need to worry about your testosterone levels if you're trying to, to gain weight or build muscle. Um, you know, eating a well-balanced, whole food, plant-based diet um, be sure that your cat, you know, the way to ensure you're getting enough protein is to be sure your calories match the amount of activity you're doing. So most, you know, if you're in the gym a lot or you're going on long runs, you do need more calories. Well, guess what? If you double your calorie intake, you double your protein intake. So, so it's really a, a non-issue, frankly. Um, and, um, and, and, and there's no foods you can eat that stimulate testosterone production. Um, and again, it's, it's really nothing to worry about. It's really about just focusing on eating a healthy diet uh, and ensuring you're getting enough calories. All right. I want to stick with you for this next one as well. It's a question from Eric who wants to know, do you have much familiarity with and what are your thoughts on a raw vegan fruit based diet? So, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's nothing wrong with a raw vegan fruit based diet. Um, and, you know, so you, again, Sometimes it's a challenge to get enough calories, especially if you're very active, uh, but, but it's certainly um, doable. Um, you know, by leaving out beans and lentils and, and such as that, you are, you know, beans and lentils, legumes and pulses are some of the most high, you know, some of the foods on the planet. And, you know, for example, if you look at the blue zone data, um, um, which are the longest live uh, communities have the longest, long, exceptional longevity um, um, across the board, um, uh, legumes was the primary source of protein. Uh, so you are losing that as a source of fiber, but, but you can make up for that through fruits and vegetables. That being said, there are a few, um, you know, it's interesting because there are a few foods that when you cook them, their actually health benefits increase. Uh, cruciferous vegetables, for example, broccoli, cauliflower, um, things like that. When you cook, um, when you cook them, there's a compound called indoles, which, which have been shown to prevent uh, certain cancers, colon cancer and such as that. And, and when you cook cruciferous vegetables, the indole content goes up. Um, tomatoes, um, when you cook tomatoes, uh, the vitamin C level does drop some, but the lycopene level, which is a, is a, a polyphenol antioxidant, which has been associated with lower risk for prostate cancer, for example, um, goes up. Same thing with carrots. When you cook carrots, the beta carotene, which is a potent antioxidant, anti-inflammatory goes up. Uh, so, so, you know, there's nothing wrong with a whole food with, with eating a raw diet, but um, there's nothing wrong with eating cooked foods either. And, and so in my own personal dietary patterns, I, I do both. I have carrots, fresh carrots in a salad, and I might cook some carrots in a stew or same thing with tomatoes. So um, yes, it's healthy um, to do, but, but I think you're maybe leaving some nutrition on the table by eliminating the legumes. Um, and, and again, there is some health, there is some nutritional value to cooking certain foods. All right. If you have a question for either Dr. Loomis or Dr. Barnard, go ahead and drop that in the chat box now or the comment section, or you can tweet them to us using the hashtag exam room live. Also want to say hi to Kathy, who's watching right now, says that she loves the Q&A so, uh, show. So thanks, Kathy. Appreciate you watching. Uh, Dr. Barnard, coming to you. This is a question from Marie. She says, I'm trying to give up meat, but I keep losing weight. I'm scared because my weight is already low and my blood pressure is too. So what do you recommend? Okay, uh, super. Well, these are great questions we're having today. Um, one thing I would do is it's sometimes it's useful to have just a check on is your weight healthy or is it in the unhealthy range. And if you think I'm I'm too thin, uh, go online and calculate your BMI. If BMI is body mass index and it's your weight adjusted for how tall you are, 
And you can go online and if you just type in BMI calculator, you put in your height, put in your weight, and if your body mass index is between 18 and a half and 25, we call that the healthy range. Now, there's a couple of caveats with body mass index. Um, it can't tell the difference between fat and muscle. Um, it's not it's not perfect. There are some problems with it, but it, but it's very reassuring. So let's say your BMI is 19 and a half, which is squarely in the healthy range, but it's on the sort of thinner than average. And if your overweight friends are saying, gee, you know, you look thinner than the rest of us, um, it, it could be reassuring to know that your BMI is, is in the healthy range. Okay, so that's it. Um, if you go on a vegan diet and a really healthy low fat vegan diet, and when people lose weight, uh, you're not gonna keep losing weight until you just blow away. What you will lose is just uh, unwanted fat. So your skin doesn't get thinner, your muscles don't go away. Um, it's just uh, an excess fat layer. And so if you're already thin, you're, you're not likely to get thinner uh, by avoiding meat. Uh, and what will sort of determine your weight is the oil content of foods because oils, fats in general, oils and any kind of fat, that's the most concentrated form of calories that you can eat. So you'll discover that if you're really low on oil, you'll lose weight more easily. If your diet has a little extra oil in it, that's guacamole, nuts, so forth, uh, your weight will not go down. So you can adjust that if you want to. All right, let's go ahead and stick with you. This is a question that comes to us from Lisa at 1208. She writes, if we use seaweed as an iodine source, how much do we need to eat weekly or daily? Oh, great. Uh, well, I hope you don't actually measure um, the amount of iodine you need, if I'm remembering correctly, is 150 micrograms a day. Um, and so um, uh, what, what you need to do is to um, just, if you have seaweed on a regular basis, that's good. Uh, most Americans do not, people in Japan eat phenomenal amounts of seaweed and they're getting loads and loads and loads of iodine. Um, but if you're not eating it on a, on a regular basis, iodized salt will work. Don't overdo it with salt, but just even a third of a teaspoon a day will give you uh, a fair amount of iodine. Um, and when all else fails, uh, you can actually take an iodine supplement if you want. They, they sell them and you'll, you'll see them. All right, uh, Dr. Loomis, coming to you. This is a question from Miro. Wants to know, should those people who have gout avoid beans? Yeah, so that's, you know, there's a lot of myths around certain foods and, and this happens to be one of them. Um, uric acid, which is, so, so what gout is, gout is, is called a crystalline arthritis. Arthritis is a generic term for inflammation of the joint. What actually happens is, is you get crystals of uric acid that, that literally precipitate out into the joint. And if, so if you take some joint fluid out of someone with gout and you look under the microscope, you see this intense inflammation, these you know, thousands of white blood cells, and they actually are ingesting these uric acid crystals. Um, it's, it's, uh, quite a painful condition. Um, I've never had it, but I've treated lots and lots of patients that have it. Uh, uric acid is a byproduct of purine metabolism and purine is a byproduct of protein catabolism. We break down protein and um, some, some foods have more purine than others. And there's just been this kind of myth that beans have a lot of purine. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't eat them if you have gout. Um, in fact, there's some evidence that beans and lentils may actually protect you against gout. Um, in general, a diet that's, that's whole food plant-based um, has a fairly limited amount of protein. It's the right amount, but it's, it's, it's about 15% of our total calories. Um, the problem is in, in a standard American diet, people way over consume protein. Um, and then you combine that with things like alcohol use and, you know, don't drink enough water, dehydration. Those are the things that predispose you to gout. But there's absolutely no reason to limit your bean intake um, with a history of um, if you have gout. Carlos is watching us on Facebook today. He wants to know, Dr. Loomis, your thoughts on vitamin K2 on strict vegetarian diets. Should he be supplementing? Yeah, so vitamin K, um, that's a great question. So vitamin K is a, a vitamin that's important, important for our bone health primarily. It also helps with blood clotting. Um, you know, it's very interesting. Um, um, it, it's more, this usually comes up in the setting of, oste of, of thinning of the bones, osteoporosis, osteopenia. Um, and in general, and research would support this, when we practice nutritional reductionism, when we take vitamins and nutrients out of our food and start taking them as supplements, they almost always have been shown not to have the same effect as, as the foods that have a lot of vitamin K, for example, 
or they even have the opposite effect. And what's very interesting, there's a great website that, that you can take a look at. It's, it's not a vegan website, but, but it's evidence-based. It's called the world's healthiest food. And, it, and it's, they, they go through and they look at both foods and they break down the nutritional content, but they also look at foods that are high in certain vitamins and mineral. And they happen to have an article on vitamin K. Um, and what's interesting, if you, so we, we typically worry about calcium for bone health. If you look at the calcium article, you'll, you'll see that cow's milk is like number 10 or 15 on the list is the best source of calcium because it's not a great source of calcium. Um, you know, it's things like tofu and collard greens and such as that. Nature's a wonderful thing. So if you go and you look at, at, on the same website at the article on vitamin K, well, guess what? The foods that are high in calcium are also high in vitamin K. So, so again, it's just something you really don't need to worry too much about um, um, as long as you're eating a wide variety of healthy green leafy vegetables and, 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 and such. Uh, vitamin K is really a, a non-issue. Dr. Barnard, this one is coming to you. Thyroid function, something that you covered in your latest book, Your Body in Balance. And Mary has a question about that at 12.05. She wants to know, can soy, oats, or gluten affect thyroid function? Uh, probably not. Um, researchers have looked at that, and the evidence suggesting that soy uh, or gluten is going to have a huge effect on your thyroid is really super minimal. Um, and the Adventist Health Study 2 um, researchers did look at different dietary patterns that seemed to make a difference. And for low thyroid, uh, the people who did the worst were the dairy consuming vegetarians. So the ovo lacto vegetarians who were not eating meat, but they were making up for it with cheese and other dairy products. They had seemed to have the highest risk of uh, hypothyroidism. When it came to hyperthyroidism, high thyroid, the people who did the worst there were the omnivores, people having dairy plus meat. The people who did best in both cases, hypo and hyper, were people following vegan diets. And what we think is happening is that a vegan diet allows you to sidestep the diet triggers that cause your body to make antibodies that attack the thyroid. So if you're avoiding dairy, you're avoiding meat, you're avoiding those dietary antigens. All right. Diesel is ready to change the world. How about this question, Dr. Barnard? Diesel wants to know, how can parents get involved to help change the menu at schools, hospital, and nursing homes? Do you know of any organizations to get involved with? Oh, aren't you good? Uh, I have to say, you know, schools really get buffeted a lot, um, partly because there are rules that they have to follow. So milk is front and center um, in the school lunch line. And parents are concerned that you might have a child who's lactose intolerant or a child who just recognizes that you don't need milk and you're better off without it and, and so forth. Um, it is a good idea to be in touch with your school administration. Let them know what you want to see um, because they are responsive to parents to the degree that they can be. Um, do be in touch with us at the Physicians Committee. We do have some terrific people um, working on trying to improve the school lunches and we have registered dietitians who are not only experts but in many cases parents themselves and they'd be glad to help you. Dr. Loomis, interesting question here about reflux. This person wants to know, how can I reduce reflux from foods like beans and cruciferous vegetables? So, um, so acid reflux is a fairly common condition for those of you who don't know what, 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 what we're talking about here. So that this, the esophagus or swallowing tube uh, meets the stomach uh, just below the diaphragm, the breathing muscle, and it passes through a little muscle called the hiatus. And, and um, normally there's a little ring of muscle at the bottom of the esophagus called the lower esophageal sphincter, and it, and it keeps food and acid from, from refluxing back up into the esophagus. And when people have acid reflux, um, there are several symptoms. You can get heartburn. Um, sometimes it can cause esophageal spasm, cause chest pain. Um, so in general, um, the foods that typically trigger acid reflux are foods that are really spicy or really acidy. Um, and in other things that increase stomach acid, like alcohol or um, anti-inflammatory medications. Um, probably the most important thing you can do is, is, is not eat within three hours of going to bed, uh, because that's just a gravity thing. You can imagine when you lay flat in bed, it's much easier for the acid to go this way than go back up this way. And sometimes when you start to develop kind of chronic reflux, it causes that lower esophageal sphincter to become um, uh, kind of dysfunctional. And so, and so you start to have symptoms with, with less common foods. Um, so, um, 
Now, occasionally people have a biomechanical problem, a condition called a hiatal hernia. And what that means is that opening I talked about is a little bigger than it should be. And it, and it, and a little knuckle of stomach kind of pushes up through there and it disrupts this normal mechanism. And that can predispose people to acid reflux. And in severe cases, it doesn't matter what you do with your diet, um, that can be an issue. So, um, um, the, you know, so in general, it's we talk about, you know, weight loss, uh, not eating within, th within three hours of going to bed, uh, being careful with these kind of highly acid foods for a bit until kind of things heal up. But if your symptoms persist, that can be a sign that there are other, there might be something else going on. And certainly you should follow up with your doctor. All right. We've got time for about three more questions. Uh, Dr. Loomis is going to stick with you here. This is going to be a popular one, especially as we hit into those uh, cold winter months and we start to see uh, some, you know, sinus and, and uh, issues pop up here. This is a question from Lynn. Wants to know, while on antibiotics, which foods are best to rebuild the microbiome? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, you know, as you as as we've learned more and more about microbiome, um, it, it, you know, it, we've come to realize really the fundamentally important role it plays in our health, and then conversely, uh, disrupted microbiome the role it plays in in not being healthy. Um, and um, you know, if we could design an environment in the modern world to disrupt our gut microbiome, we've done it. I mean, human babies are born without with a sterile gut, and then we have a vaginal delivery, we breastfeed, and the rest of our lives we get our food out of the dirt and on and on. Well, these days, you fast forward to the modern world, we C-section babies, we don't breastfeed, we put so much stuff in the on our food, you know, pesticides, herbicides, we have to scrub the dirt off, we polluted the water, so we have to put chlorine in it to kill the bacteria. Um, and then we start passing out antibiotics, you know, at a young age, like their candy and on and on and on. So, so um, th there really is almost a kind of this epidemic of dysbiosis. And on top of that is the food we eat. So the things that determine our gut microbiome is primarily driven by our diet, um, frankly. And uh, we know that the, the most potent prebiotic foods is the soluble fiber that you find in things like beans and lentils and, and, and such as that. I mean, th that's probably the most powerful food. There's a, um, there's a great uh, recent book out by, uh, I call him Dr. B. It's called Fiber Fueled. And it really does a deep dive into the role fiber plays in health in general, but, but specifically in, in, in the, one of the subtitles is, is you know, developing a healthy gut microbiome. So that's it's really a great book. I, I think he may have been a guest on the sh on the show, as a matter of fact. Um, but um, but but soluble fiber in in the form of beans and lentils in particular are probably the the one. If you had one food to increase, that would that would be it. And then decreasing you know your intake of processed foods, fatty foods, things like that, because you, the bacteria that like to eat those, you don't want to feed them on an ongoing basis. Yeah, you're talking about Dr. Uh, Will Bolsowitz. Great yes. guy. Love yes. having him on the show. Uh, Dr. Barnard, I'm going to come over to you. Earlier, we had somebody write in wondering about losing too much weight. Well, this gentleman by the name of David wants to know something similar, but he says, if I'm eating a pretty strict whole food plant-based diet, but I'm having a hard time losing weight, would it help to cut down on whole grains such as brown rice? Um, I wouldn't go there um, because if, if you think about it, when Japan was at their most healthy, before McDonald's invaded Tokyo, um, what were people eating? They were, they were the thinnest, healthiest people, longest lived people on the planet, and rice was their main food. They ate lots and lots of rice, and they weren't gaining lots of weight until the fast foods came in, and that displaced the rice, and in came the cheese and meat. So it's really the fatty foods you want to be careful about. So if you're already vegan, what's got fat in it? Um, added oils? Uh, nuts, nut butters, guacamole, um, avocado in general. Th those, are, those are really the ones where the calories are really dense. Now, you do need a little bit of fat in your diet, but the traces that are naturally in vegetables and beans and fruits, um, th there's not a lot, but that's more than enough fat for your body to work from. And if you're adding more, then it makes the weight loss more difficult. All right. Final question, Dr. Barnard. This one goes to you. It's from Veronica. Wants to know, can being vegan help with asthma? Oh, my goodness sakes. Yes. Um, if you have asthma or if you have a child who has asthma, run. Do not walk to a completely plant-based diet. Um, asthma 
in the best situation, it's a, it's a nuisance. In the worst situation, it can kill you. Um, there are kids who are dying every single day from asthma. Now, asthma is an autoimmune condition where you are reacting to something and then you get this vice on your lungs and you can't breathe. Um, that something that you're reacting to can be environmental um, allergens, it can be pet dander, uh, but it can also be dietary uh, antigens as well. And for, for reasons we have never quite figured out, when people get away from dairy in particular, they seem to respond less to other antigens. It, it's not as if they were allergic to the dairy per se, but it seemed to make other allergies or other sensitivities worse. So don't take this on faith um, and don't cancel your doctor's appointment, whatever, take whatever treatments you need, but give it a try. A completely dairy-free diet and especially just a vegan diet with no animal products at all and do it really strictly for a while and see if the asthma doesn't improve. Once again, you don't stop uh, medical treatments un unless your doctor says you don't need your inhaler anymore. Uh, but many, many, many people who go on vegan diets, you know, they find their asthma improves quite dramatically. And, and that's often true for other auto autoimmune conditions as well. Dr. Barnard, Dr. Loomis, gentlemen, thank you so very much for your time and your wisdom as always. This has been fantastic. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Chuck. All right. If we did not get to your question on the show today, have no fear. We will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. So keep on posting those in the comments section now. I promise you we do see each and every one that comes into the mailbag. And also, if you enjoyed the show today, why not go ahead and like the Physicians Committee on Facebook and subscribe to our channel here on YouTube so that you get automatically notified every single time that we go live with the exam room live, which happens to be Monday through Friday at noon Eastern. And also, don't forget to subscribe to the Exam Room Podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you get your shows. And when you do that, please leave a five-star rating as well. Speaking of which, the most recent episode, I had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Christy Funk, esteemed breast cancer surgeon. Just phenomenal. Uh, she and I uh, had a wonderful segment where we handed out the awards to the best cancer-fighting foods. I mean, we had a ton of categories. We got all dressed up for this. It was a full-on award show. So we handed out the award for best fruit the best vegetable, the best legume, the best spice, the best nut, all of those, the best ones that fight cancer. We talk about those cancer fighting properties that are found in there. And because it's an award show, we had to hand out a lifetime achievement award, right? So we did that to fiber. So if you want to check out that episode, get uh, get in on the fun, get in on the science, get in on the life-saving information, just subscribe to the Exam Room Podcast by the Physicians Committee, wherever you get your favorite podcasts from. Speaking of life-saving information, all throughout the month of October, this is our Let's Beat Breast Cancer campaign. And I would love for you to join with us in that battle. We have put together four steps, four prongs that can help lower your risk of developing breast cancer. You see those four simple steps right there on the screen right now. Choose plant-based foods, move more, limit your alcohol consumption, maintain a healthy weight. You can learn more about each one of those steps and pledge to follow them. Join with us in that fight. And when you take that pledge to join us, you will also be automatically entered to win a great grand prize pack valued at up to $600 from one of our tremendous sponsors, sponsors like Mama Says. And we cannot say thank you enough to Mama Says and all of our great sponsors for helping us with the Let's Beat Breast Cancer campaign this year as well. So head over to letsbeatbreastcancer.org to take that pledge today. And for today, that, in fact, my friend, is all the time that we have. I want to say thank you one more time to Drs. Neil Barnard and Jim Loomis for joining us on the program today and to the wonderful crew behind the scenes that makes this show possible. Thank you, guys. And to everyone who is watching my exam roomies, thank you as well for spending time out of your day to raise your nutrition IQs with us. On behalf of everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again on Monday. And until then, stay safe take a stand, and keep it plant-based.